I have a chance to give both sermons today. So uh, the first message in the Bible study, I talked about the kingdom of God in the book of Acts. And this sermon is going to be about the kingdom of God in the book of Matthew. As I mentioned earlier in the earlier Bible study, I am really blessed to have three chances today to have three different speaking styles. In other words, the, what I did in the interactive study, of course, is I try to encourage as many comments from the audience as I can. I'm, I'm the moderator. I, I want them to talk more. And I'm trying to draw them out to talk more. So that's a different style. The Bible study style is to go through a lot of scriptures and go through a lot of history. That's more the Bible study style. And now the sermon style, I, I want to do it a little differently. I'm even trying to show the men that the Bible studies are a little longer and the sermons are a little bit shorter. We try to try to make it audience friendly. We give you a chance for fellowship. And of course, you can come through all three of the presentations or pick and choose whatever the presentations you want to come. But we try to hit different ones. But when we talk about the kingdom of God out of the book of Matthew, just turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. I do at least want to make some historical references and some uh, theological or studious references. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, I want to make something, say something up front about the book of Matthew and the kingdom of God. In the other gospel writings of Mark, Luke, and John, the kingdom is talked about the kingdom of God. Matthew is the one who refers to the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. Not, not all the time. If you look up in the concordance every time he talks about the kingdom, he sometimes does say the kingdom of God. But usually he says the kingdom of heaven. And you probably have noticed that before, but if you hadn't noticed that before, you may notice it now. But that's, I chose Matthew. I, don't, I think Luke may have more scriptures about the kingdom than Matthew does. But there's certain things, and why I chose Matthew, Matthew's got the kingdom parables, the beautiful kingdom parables. And so he had a certain way of describing and, and talking about the kingdom. And I don't really want, I'm really not wanting to spend so much time here in this sermon presentation going back over history as much I'm trying to extract Christian living out of it. And that's why I thank those at the Interactive Bible Study who are helping me with that in preparation. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. When Matthew says the kingdom of heaven, he doesn't mean that necessarily the kingdom of heaven right at this moment. In other words, being in heaven right at this moment where deceased people are. In other words, many people think they go to heaven when they die, and immediately after they die, and then they sometimes use the fact that Matthew says kingdom of heaven, they sometimes use that as proof. Well, I think Peter describes what most of us in the church of God believe about the kingdom of heaven. He says here, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and does not fade away, it's reserved in heaven for you. So in other words, many people, when talking about the kingdom of heaven, we believe that's where God is and that's where Christ is. And so thereby that's where it's reserved. So even those of us who believe in a person when they die, they go in like a sleep condition to a future resurrection. They, they don't, we don't believe that the, when Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven, we don't believe that's proof that people go to heaven when they die. I point that out because some people do say that. But we do believe that, as Peter says here, the kingdom is reserved in heaven. But when you read through most of Matthew, you're going to find out he most of the time says kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm not going to read through every, time, every scripture on that. Uh, I do want to read a couple scriptures, and I want us to think about it, how it applies to us. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. And when you think about the kingdom, when we talk about the, how the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, we want to understand how it motivates us today. How the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, motivates us today. And then hopefully we can help others. Friends, I know you're around people who are suffering from time to time. I know around, you're around people who need help. You, you're around people who need encouragement. You're around people who need support. And the more we can accurately reflect the kingdom by our example can help them. 
And not only by our example, then, if we are prepared to describe the kingdom in a beneficial way, we can do a lot of good. We can be a lot of help. See, he says here in Matthew 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Friends, your view of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, can help your approach in life. So it's not just an academic head knowledge. It's actually something that can affect your behavior, how you view life. Poor in spirit, meaning instead of being haughty, instead of being arrogant, instead of being abusive, instead of being pushy, if we have this right approach, it's because a lot of times we're looking to God's promises and looking to how he's going to help us. Now, it talks about all these beatitudes are beautiful. It mentions the kingdom of heaven again in verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How in the world can you deal with false accusation? How is it possible that anybody can deal with false accusation? Brethren, I believe, and friends, I believe that the more we have the view of the kingdom of God, the correct view of what God's promise, what God offers, what God is doing, the more we can actually it can change our lives. So it can change your life, and it has changed your life, but you can help others change their life. You can help others deal. You can help others cope. And that there's no greater calling. There may be other callings as high or as important, but there's no greater calling than to have people deal with trials in life, to have people deal with suffering. And my, my comment is, the more we understand the kingdom of God, it can change us. And the more we understand the kingdom of God, we can help encourage others. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. By the way, one, one problem we have with our interactive Bible study, it's my fault. I don't give people advance notice of what the subject is. So we still have great discussions, but the best interactive studies are when people know in advance what we're going to cover. Because then they can prepare. I mean, we still get some great comments, but we can get some good preparation. In two weeks, I'm, I'm gone next week, so I'll do the interactive study in two weeks, and I want to talk about the phrase, many are called and few are chosen. And the reason is when we had a great discussion, people sharing, and by the way, the, the only rule I have in the interactive study is we have to be polite. I don't mind if people disagree with me. I don't mind if people disagree with each other. But I, if, if someone's not polite, I'll probably call them out on that because I, we will be polite. We will not have people saying, like, this is the only way to see it. You have to see things my way. No, we, that's, just, that's, that's foolish. And we don't, have, we don't have that in there. So I certainly don't mind people disagreeing. We all plan, and when I speak today, you know what I'm doing? Planting seeds. That's what the special music does. That's what the song service does. The interactive Bible study, all of us have a chance to plant seeds, not just me. We all plant seeds. Well, in the interactive study about a month or maybe two months ago, it was brought up about many are called, few are chosen. That came into the discussion. And I tried to politely mention to the individuals that I quite didn't see it the way a couple of the individuals saw it. The question came up when it says, many are called, few are chosen. Chosen for what? Some people think that means that there'll be very few in the kingdom of God. And I want to hear more, I want them to show me more about that. Because you're going to find a lot of scriptures that give various indications. If we bring them together, we guess look at the whole picture. I tend to think it means fewer people will be in the kingdom, not in the first resurrection. In other words, I think, I think again, excuse me, I think it means there'll be few in the first resurrection, that there'll, there'll be more people in the kingdom than a lot of people imagine. I have friends who believe everybody's going to be in the kingdom. I have friends who believe even Satan's going to be somehow converted, changing in the kingdom. I don't believe that, however. Uh, they, they believe that. The point is, when it says, many are called, few are chosen, chosen for what? And we're going to talk, I want to get that way, we have a chance, a couple weeks to think about it, to think about what, the, what that number implies. Because there's some scriptures here we can throw into the mix. Like here, first, uh, Matthew, Matthew 5, verses 19 and 20. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of God. Whoever does not and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
Okay, so according to Matthew 5, 19, some people are called least and some people are called great. Again, you know, I gotta follow my own advice. I say we have to be careful not getting tripped up over the English words. But the concept there is some people will be viewed more favorably than others if you take this, these English words that way. And so again, these are the kind of things we, we can talk about. We can look at all these verses and say, what does it mean? Verse 20 says, For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So again, if people take the English words of Matthew 5.20, that would seem to go against the concept that everybody's going to be in the kingdom. I'm just, I'm just saying as you have this, this discussion, that's why you've got to put the puzzle together, a lot of scriptures. Matthew 5.20 gives the indication that some people will not be in the kingdom, and verses 19, verse 19 kind of indicates that some people will be viewed more with favor and not with favor. Of course, we would never want to use these to, to encourage competition or fighting or anything. But when we look at this, we look at these verses squarely. We look at these verses straight on, trying to understand. And we have plenty of opportunity as we look through all the verses in the book of Matthew about the kingdom of God. You get to come across many different subjects. Now let's look down at Matthew 8, verses 11 and 12. Matthew 8, verses 11 and 12. Maybe I should start in verse 10, because I see the red letters, words of Christ start in verse 10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed. These were, this is about the centurion and the faith of the centurion. Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found so great faith, not even in Israel. That's interesting because there are some people who are not necessarily the chosen ones who show great faith over those who are considered the chosen ones. I think that's good to remember because some people might say, well, I'm converted or I'm this or I'm that. Well, that doesn't prove anything. That doesn't prove anything. If someone has a title or has a name, that doesn't prove anything because even the centurion who didn't have the, the, the chosen name, he had faith over those who you might have expected to have faith. And that's why someone say, Dave, would you expect a lot out of the church of God? Well, really, I don't. We were talking in the interactive study about when we first came in contact with it. In fact, many people moved to East Texas. Uh, Bruce Graham brought it up. We were talking about when we moved to East Texas, we had high expectations. You thought you may have been coming to God's kingdom on earth. And then you realize that wasn't the case. So I would say a long time ago, I had high expectations of the people of God. And I have to tell you, now I have low expectations of the people of God. And the advantage is this. I'm not disappointed as much. Since I have low expectations, I'm rarely disappointed. If I expect people of God to fight and, and argue and, squ and squabble, I don't get disappointed as much. When I expected perfection, you're disappointed all the time. Doesn't that make sense? So I have low expectations, and some of these scriptures help me. If someone is in Israel, that doesn't mean, I mean, spiritual Israel, that doesn't mean I expect them to have faith when a centurion might have more faith. I'm just believing the words of the Christ. The words of the Christ says where you attend, what your title is, does not guarantee anything. Jesus said, according to the scripture, if it's correct translation, I have not seen faith in all of Israel like this. I say to you, that many will come from east and west. So that's why when we talk about many are called, few are chosen, how is this scripture going to fall, fall into that? How is it going to fall into that? We have, we'll look at them all together. We're not afraid of it. We'll, we'll have a good time studying it together. It'll be fun. Many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Again, so how do we define the word many, the English word many? I mean, we don't know what that means. Is that five? Is that 50? Is that 1,000? I mean, but the, the saying here, the English translation of the New King James, is saying many will sit down in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that's why we're going to have an interesting discussion about many are called, few are children. We're going to have a great talk about that. But notice verse 12. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. Someone can say, well, that person over there attends a church of God. And what does that prove? 
Well, if they're attending a church of God, that must mean they're right. That means no such thing. That person over there speaks in the church of God. So that proves they're right. They wouldn't be allowed to speak in the church of God if they weren't saying the right thing. <laughs> That's no, there's no guarantee at all. Some people among the kingdom, the children of the kingdom, some people who have the right title, some people who have people have high expectations for, will be in outer darkness. Again, that's, I think, a metaphor. But as a metaphor, it paints a picture. The lesson I'm learning is, it doesn't matter where you attend. It doesn't matter what your title is. Right is right and wrong is wrong. And so we listen for what is right. We follow what is right. And we don't, get, we don't allow the outside things to force us to accept or not accept. But isn't it interesting when he said many will come, but some that you expect to be there, some of the, some, the sons of the kingdom, they won't be there. That's something for us because let's, let's, let's apply it to ourselves. Do you consider yourself a child of the kingdom? Well, I hope you do. But if, if you consider yourself a child of the kingdom because you're, of your relationship with the father and son, you want to be doing what the father and son say. You, that's the criteria you want to look for. Let's look at some other verses. I'm going to, let's look at Matthew 18, verses 1 through 4. Matthew 18, verses 1 through 4. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, he doesn't consider it competition, but the disciples do. People do that. Which church is the best church? Who's the best church in the congregation? Who's the best person in this congregation? Who's the best person in that congregation? Isn't that a human thing? And that's what they ask him. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? Now, they could have been asking, what are the greatest characteristics? That would be a better question. Jesus called a little child to him and put him, the little child in the middle of them. And said, I surely I say to you, until you are, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, being like a little child. It's interesting about a little child. There are certainly parts of little children we don't want to be like. We don't want to be little children throwing temper tantrums. That's not what he's talking about. We don't want to be little children who are selfish. It's kind of fun to watch little children be selfish. What part of being a little child is he talking about? Well, the no guile thing. The little, the little kids come up to you and they'll look at you and say, you've got no hair on the top of your head. So you may think that, but you may not say it. Well, you'll find, it, you'll find a nice, polite way of saying it. They're not thinking about polite. They're just like, you've got no hair on the top of your head. No guile. So again, obviously there's things little children do. We don't want to be like little children. They throw a temper. They don't get their own way. They lay on the floor and kick. I've seen adults do that. I've seen clergy do that. Man, I've seen clergy lay on the floor. Not literally lay on the floor and kick, but they're like that because they'll throw a temper tantrum. That's not impressive. I see two-year-olds do that. I see three-year-olds do that. That's, that's not impressive. But I've been in church a long time. Well, that's shame on you then. You shouldn't be doing that. Why, why are you doing that? Then it goes on to say, Whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So we find out what the trait is of this little child. What traits are, again, the, their openness. And I say, kids are sneaky. Yeah, kids are really sneaky. Kids, teenagers are sneaky, man. I've learned, I've learned a lot about how not to lie from watching teenagers. Well, I remember when I was a teenager, so it starts there. But, and again, I, I know the game some of them play, and I never try to, I never try to push a teenager to lie. Because they may be weak and they may lie, and lying's not a good habit. So sometimes you, you ask them a question, they'll give an answer, and you're reading through the lines what they're saying. But you don't want them to lie, so I don't, even, I don't want to put them in a position to lie. Because it's just a bad, it's a bad character trait, and I don't want to nudge them to a character trait. You know, so, so sometimes you ask a teenager a question, and you'll know the answer, and you'll think, okay, I, I see what's going on. So, and again, uh, by the way, now when I've had to do investigations with a teen, teenager, I really put them in a position to lie. And I tell them, I said, listen, I'm asking these questions very directly now. It's not a good thing to lie. But again, I try, in general, I try not to push people to lie. Why well, do that? Well, we've well, we got to make them accountable. Really? You can, you can, your, your position in life is to make the world accountable. 
Are you the judge of the world? You're going to try to make everyone accountable? That's really your position. But a lot of religious people are, oh, they want to make everybody accountable. They want to make sure everyone does the right thing. They want to make sure everyone eats the right food. They want to make sure everyone says the right words. That they say things just right. Really? That's, you think your position in life is to go around doing that? Mm, that's not. We want to be helping. We want to be serving. We want to be blessing. I have on the end of the handout, because I'm going to end short today, I have scriptures about the, the kingdom parables. And again, for those of you who don't have a handout, you can look to see, just look in the, in the Bible about the kingdom parables because there's lessons to be learned. I'll, I'll quickly go through them. I'm not going to go through them in detail. I'm going to just quickly refer to them. Matthew 13, verses 1 through 9, is the parable of the sower and the seed. As I said, that's how we live life, folks. God plants seeds. We plant seeds, and God gives the increase. Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30, talks about the parable of the tares in the field. Learn a lot about that, tares in the field. Someone could say, are there tares in this church? Who can, there probably are. Aren't you trying to identify them? Nah. Nah. Don't, I don't waste any moment trying to identify a tear. What's right's right. What's wrong's wrong. It's pretty simple. Life is pretty simple. When someone says something that's right, it's right. When someone says something that's wrong, it's wrong. Why aren't you going to try to identify it so they're, so they're to identify their, their fate in life? Nah, I'll let Christ be their judge. What if you entertain, there's a scripture that says you entertain angels unawares. What if we entertain terrors unawares? How's that going to be a bad thing? You say, well, won't the terror influence you? Well, no, if you're taking, if you're taking responsibility for your own choices, and you're just showing kindness to people. You can be kind to a person of the body of Christ. You can be kind to a tear. You can be kind to an atheist. You can be kind to everybody. But again, when you're kind to people, that doesn't mean you let them rule you. You don't let them run your life. Then Matthew 13, verses 31 and 32, the parable of the grain of mustard seed. The kingdom of God starts small. You know, the Baptists have a good practice. I love this practice. Some, some, some Baptists do this, more country churches. They don't like that their churches get too big. Some Baptist congregations, if it gets to a certain size, they will multiply and start a different congregation close by. I know some places have used that number as 150. But I'm sure it varies all over. Take any number you want. But instead of, in other words, some people like to build these mega churches. But there's great value. In fact, the, you know what the strength of a mega church is, by the way? I've talked to friends who are in mega churches. I remember one guy I baptized. He's now he no longer follows the way of the Church of God. He's in a big mega church somewhere, and I started asking him, "What do you do in these mega churches?" Because it seems like you just let anyone come in. You want you just try to get them in there. He said, "Yes, we do." I said, well, "What standards do you have?" Just curious. What I know you're a grace based, but what standards do you have? They're, the strength of the mega church is the small groups. Groups for. Uh, one person, fatherless, uh, recovering alcoholics, whatever. So they still use the, small, the concept of the small groups to do their real work. They just, get, they just suck everyone in to get everyone in the door so that they can maybe reach them. But many churches go for the small. So again, grain of mustard seed. Matthew 13, 33, the parable of the leaven. Again, God's kingdom grows. How much leaven are you doing? How much leaven are you having people grow? How much are you influencing people to go toward the kingdom? How about your family? Is any good leavening spreading in your family? I realize that Paul used leaven as a bad thing for sin, but Christ used leaven as a good thing, so you have to apply it as it sees fit. Leaven is not always bad. I mean, you can judge that based on the cakes and desserts you eat. Sometimes that leaven's really good. But here, the example, leaven's, in other words, leaven is bad when it's sin spreading. Leaven is good when it's the kingdom growing. Because the example of leaven is it, it spreads. So again, how, how much is the kingdom spreading in your life? Did, have you helped the kingdom to spread to anyone new this week? There's a parable about the treasure in the field. The kingdom is so valuable that you'll just, it's so important it's over everything. The merchant and the expense of pearls, the same thing. Is the kingdom like a pearl to you? The kingdom of the net cast into the sea. The kingdom of the unforgiving servant. 
the unforgiving servant when they, you know, are we, are we showing forgiveness and kindness to others? The parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Are we taking care of our responsibilities? It's not about who's been doing it the longest. It's not about who's been in the church the longest. It's not by who's, you know, all these physical criteria people use. People will talk about, I've been in the church since 1948. And uh, what does that mean? It means you're old is what it means. I mean, beyond, beyond that, it could be good or it could be, what have you been doing, what have you been doing since 6 o'clock this morning? Well, you're not worried, you're not impressed with 1948? No, what have you been doing since 7 o'clock this morning? What have you been doing since noon? What have you been doing since the start of this sermon? You know, David, David, are you giving a good sermon? Well, I'm trying my best. Well, as I tell people, a lot of times, actually, there are a lot of people who like hearing me speak. And I tell them, I said, the only sermon that counts is the next one. It's the only one that counts. The only thing that counts to us is the next three minutes. And I'm going to let you out. All, all that matters is the next three minutes. I've got to make these next three minutes as, as helpful as I can. Then there's the parable of the marriage of the king's son. Whoa, that's interesting. Again, talking about many are called, few are chosen. In Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding garment. Oh, that's interesting. What kind of wedding garment should we have? What does that mean? The parable of the ten virgins. Are we going to sleep? Five went, all went to sleep. Five did the right thing. Five didn't. Is that an exact number? I don't, I don't, I'm not worried about the exact number. I'm worried about the lesson. You know, someone say, well, half the church is going to be right and half the church is going to be wrong. Don't take that parable to draw that conclusion. Take the parable to realize we're all sleeping. Let's, what are we going to do about it? How about the parable of the talents? Again, are we, are we using our talents? Are we using God's talents? Are we responding to God? And then the, the parable of the sheep and goats. Are we doing the things, that the, the, the right things? When Christ said, when you did this, you were doing it to me. When you, did, when you weren't doing this, you were avoiding me. You were neglecting me. It's interesting about that thing about what's important. In fact, a lot of times I'll read that at a funeral at the cemetery. And because think about it, here many religions want to honor the, the prestige and the big shots, whether it be the Pope or whomever, the cardinals and all these people, they're, they're, they're giving this certain prestige and, and that's what their life re, surrounds itself, revolves around. When I like to think my life revolves around those people who aren't considered the elite, aren't considered the special. You know, are, are, we, are we taking them to doctor's appointments? Are we praying for them? Are we uh, helping them? Are we, are, we, are, we, are we helping them with their cars? Are we helping them with their whatever goes wrong? Are we helping them? So what's glorious about that? You should hobnob with the big shots. Well, you can do all the hobnobbing with the big shots you want to hobnob with. I want, I want to hang around my people. I want to hang around people who are like me, that I'm like them. And we just work through this life together. We just we want to we want to worship God and we want to serve others, and we, we want to do our little part in this world and just help as many people as we can. But rather, I would encourage you, as you look through this, the scriptures about the kingdom of heaven that are found in throughout the whole Bible. But today, I just wanted to give you some sampling from the book of Matthew itself. And I didn't read; I read hardly just a, a, a sliver of them. But really, I would encourage you to read those kingdom parables and learn the lessons because Matthew, the book of Matthew gives us a lot of insight into the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And I hope that you will spend some valuable time being inspired by these messages from the Bible, from these parables from the Bible, and then hopefully you can reflect the kingdom of God in your life.